All right, everybody's awake? All right. So uh, first of all, thank you very much, Wynn, for uh, bringing me home. As I uh, briefly introduced myself earlier, I uh, came fresh off the boat uh, from India in 99. And uh, it's been a pretty good journey so far, last 16 years in the US. And uh, so I wear two hats. I'm an associate professor at Washington State University, uh, which has been called the death star of the Apple industry because they are too, so huge. I heard this term very recently. So that's pretty interesting. But, uh, and also, working with the farmers over there, I've learned of the issues, not just in Washington, but I've had the good fortune of traveling across the United States now, as well as abroad. And there were some issues that are not just faced by the folks uh, over in Washington state, but that's a common problem. And I'm just going to share uh, my story with you guys, uh, what solutions we've developed so that you as farmers can um, react quickly to changing market dynamics and still remain profitable. OK, I all right, got it. So just a brief introduction, grew up uh, in New Delhi, started my PhD over there. And uh, while I was doing my PhD, I, was, uh, I got a fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation to come to uh, the Piscataway campus, Waxman Institute, for one year. And I was just supposed to go back. But guess that never happened. I was uh, given a, uh, like a scientist position, and, and that's been my story. So um, really, it's sort of a homecoming. I've learned from the farmers, and I'm, I'm really glad to be back to share uh, what we've developed with you guys. Um, and now I'm in Pullman, uh, the home of Washington State University. And I've been there for about 10 years. And I, I really want to plug in one thing for the farmers who, who, were great te who have been great teachers to me. Uh, they basically put a bag on me and say, hey, go pick fruit if you really want to understand you know, what's wrong with the fruit or how do you pick the fruit. They gave me bare root trees to plant those as well, which scared a few farm workers that Indians are coming to take their jobs. But <laughs> thankfully, that didn't happen. Anyway, so it's been an interesting uh, story. But again, thanks to all the, f the farming community for adopting me and teaching me what I know. And working with the farmers, um, there was a big motivation to take what I uh, do in my research program to the lab, from the lab to the field. I'm really motivated by the fact that solutions in a, in a scientific lab don't need to stay on papers or patents or graduate students. Real impact really happens when you implement those things in the field. So this is what, you know, that kind of spirit that I picked up uh, growing up as well. So really excited about sharing this story with you on that part. My program has been focusing on multiple aspects, and it covers the entire value chain. I have a basic research program in genomics and biotechnology, and then I also have an applied research program which focuses on all these areas, pre-production, pre-harvest, and post-harvest areas. And uh, I'm going to touch primarily on all these three topics. So this is a beautiful pear orchard. This is a photograph from a European uh, visit that I had done. And I was amazed to see the architecture and everything. This is a great thing. If, and I, I know in the Northeast, it's you pick fruit. But this could be a very easy way to manage an orchard, et cetera. But how do you get there? Uh, that's the problem, right? You want to also, there are new varieties coming in. How do you get those kind of trees that are uniform? How do you really manage these things? And that's kind of the problem we've been solving. But before you can plant an orchard, uh, most of these trees grow on their rootstocks. So there's a big bottleneck that we face. You know, There is new genetics becoming available. Rootstock breeders are releasing rootstocks by the dozens every year. But the process of multiplying those rootstocks is very slow. I mean, the current nurseries do an excellent job, but their inventory is stuck in the soil, in the ground. You know, recently I was being interviewed by a magazine, and they asked me, can you explain this to me in terms of corn seed? I said, like, OK, that's a good, good way to look at it. So I just wanted to share that thought with you. Nature has a factory to produce more seeds for corn, right? I mean, you basically, within six months, you can get a crop, and you have millions of seeds that you want. Now, that proverbial seed for the tree guys, it takes about 10 years to produce that tree that then gets planted. So I'm going to walk through that problem, and that's what we are solving. We are trying to shorten the time, or we have shortened the time to produce that proverbial seed 
for the tree fruit and nut industry. Now, the model is shifting. Consumers are demanding the moneymaker varieties. I mean, uh, new varieties that are coming online, of course, uh, recently I spoke at IFTA, they're calling them the money makers, the Honeycrisp, Gala, and Fuji apples. So how do you really plant them quickly? There's a new, and there are newer strains of Honeycrisp. There's a red strain that people are crazy for on the west side, on the west coast, but they can't find the rootstocks for the next five years. Of course, there are new rootstocks coming from Cornell, just from our neck of the woods here. Uh, these are aphid, woolly aphid resistant or replant disease resistant. How do we really try to get those rootstocks? One more push that's happened in Europe, uh, going from 200 to 300 trees to the acre, people are planting up to 4,000 trees to the acre. That pushes further demand for rootstocks. And the big nurseries are pretty much tied up with their inventory. And if, if the f a smaller farmer wants 50, 50 trees to 1,000 trees or 5,000 trees, I don't think they register on the list at all. So we are kind of solving that problem as well. Because our system has freed itself from the soil and the seasons, we can actually uh, provide any number of trees uh, that are needed. And there are tissue culture labs uh, across the nation, but these were mom and pop shops or uh, people who graduated and set up a shop. They are basically downloading protocols, processes from uh, you know, established labs like mine, which develop new procedures, new approaches. But that doesn't really work because what you may have developed for a Geneva rootstock, 41, doesn't work for 935. And I'll show you some examples of that. So uh, that's where we brought in the, the broad-based knowledge in plant growth and development, physiology, photobiology. And we were able to bring it all together to really pr uh, produce very excellent amount of material. And the market is unpredictable, and I would like to add that season is unpredictable. We had a big freeze here in 2012. I mean, how do you quickly recover from those things? If you go back to getting that seed, proverbial seed tree produced from the nursery process, it's a very long issue. I do want to plug in for nurseries as well. In fact, they've given this, this feedback. They want, they want this change to come, not something we developed on my own. You know? So this is all based from farmer feedback, nursery feedback. So this is sort of developing solutions for the industry and bringing it to market from within rather than from the outside. So just to give you a brief, why does it take 10 years to produce a tree? This is how the uh, tree production has always been done. Uh, you are able to get virus-free material. Uh, not all states in the country have that requirement. Uh, basically, it goes to a rootstock nursery. Gets, the rootstocks get transferred to a finished tree nursery. And the, the farmer who's trying to produce trees, basically, from the, my, the, the moment the tree starts its journey, it's about 10 years before they can get fruit. Uh, there are other, as I said, tissue culture labs. They actually add more time rather than reduce time in the process because they, they are providing very small trees that don't do very well. There's high mortality rates. So this is the problem we are solving. So just to kind of walk you through, uh, the rootstocks are basically uh, made in these uh, stool beds. You've got uh, you know, one whip. You try to take about four years to really produce those little suckers or basically uh, whips that can be then sent to a finished tree nursery that, that they can bud for you and then give it to you. Another process is layering. These are two main uh, processes. I would like to acknowledge Stephen Hoying from Cornell Extension for these slides. Uh, this is a second year stool bed. And this photograph kind of says it all. If you have a freeze, it's dead. So you have to start all over again or wait a couple of more years. We just don't have that kind of luxury of time today. And this is a mature uh, stool bed after about four to five years. Now these, these will be harvested uh, and sent to a finished tree nursery. And a lot of this material is bare root. I mean, obviously, because you can't really keep the roots intact at this point. And when I've talked to, you know, this is a common basic fundamental point of plant biology. If the roots are not good, the plant material will not survive very well in the soil. It will take some time to reestablish. So somewhere back in the day, about 100 years ago, somebody figured out, hey, let's do this bare root product. And that's easy with the process, but it basically damages the plant material. It puts a lot of issues. It adds a lot of issue. And everybody said, hey, Ahmed, can you make a plant with intact roots? I said, yeah, containerized production is a way to do it. And that's what we are really doing in this particular case. 
So just to give you an idea, you plant one plant in the first year in a stool bed. In about four years, you can get 100 plants from one particular you know, whip. Uh, it's a hundredfold multiplication of a plant in four years. Assuming you had no pest problems, you had no season problems. Uh, so there is a lot of variability. So especially when we are trying to go to these uniform orchards, you cannot have variable starting material. You need to have uniform. And uh, on the West Coast, of course, there's a lot of mechanization people want. So if you had trees which are not uniform, a robot is actually doing more thinking than really acting on the plant material. Uh, so the cost per is, unit is low in this process, but long time for return on investment, cost of lost opportunity is no longer realistic in our businesses. I mean, like any other business, one, everybody needs to be efficient and precise. So how did I get involved in this work? So I used to do a lot of tissue culture back in the day. I worked with about 25 different plant species, including monocots, grasses, et cetera, and dicots as well. So about 10 years ago, when I joined Washington State University, I had never worked with tr uh, tree fruits. I mean, my program was in tree fruits, but I had only worked with strawberry, which is a relative of apples, if you didn't know that. So it's from the rose family, that's why. And when I arrived at WSU, uh, Gennaro Fazio from Cornell, who had developed these Geneva rootstocks, approached me. He says, well, I've developed these great rootstocks, but they don't root very well in, in stool beds, one. Secondly, the, t the tissue culture labs, uh, some of the major ones cannot multiply. There is something wrong in their media. This is our little gel structure. So basically, it's horticulture in a box. And you can tell this is malnutrition. Very simple as that. So we very quickly developed media, and within about a few weeks, we were able to really grow healthy Geneva 41s. This was something done in 2007, 2008. Uh, we developed these protocols. And story continued from 41s to Geneva 935s to Giesler rootstocks in cherry to pear rootstocks. So we were very able to quickly multi, uh, develop efficient solutions, not just how, how to grow these things in the box, but take them to a greenhouse and develop containerized products for the industry, because we wanted to really develop a whole system solution rather than, OK, I've done tissue culture. Now you can take it from us, the media, and then come back for the next one. We just wanted to kind of get it done properly. Uh, actually, in fact, I had reached out to the nursery industry to create a co-op back then, but that didn't work out, because everybody's busy with their own system. So actually, I started with four of my grad students and one technician started a company called Phytelligence. And this also happened because the nurseries kept coming to me, and so did the growers. Can you get us 5,000 plants? Can you get us 50,000 plants, 100,000, half a million? When those numbers kept coming in, I was like, we can't do this in my research lab, because the mandate over there is research, not service. And this is how we basically uh, started this company. Uh, the company's name is Phytelligence. Basically, it's an efficient and reduced risk process. So we've developed a very efficient um, plant multiplication process, which uh, is already has been commercialized. There are products in the market, and I'll show you that is the next part of this whole thing. So the new part is that we, with our process, a farmer can, you know, from the starting point, when you have the rootstock, you can get to fruiting within five years. Now, that's somewhat more realistic. You know, I used to work with everything but trees, so I'm a little bit impatient. I can't think of 10 to 15-year time cycles. We need the work done now. There are new varieties coming in. You don't, so do you guys know that when a new variety is released, it can be up to 15 years before it reaches the market properly? I mean, who has that kind of time now, especially with the economic forces the way they are? So uh, this is what we bring in. In fact, we've also started doing virus screening in-house at Phytelligence, uh, and also uh, working on developing protocols to clean the virus as well, so that we can help the USDA system, which is really clogged up with a uh, lot of work, and that delays everything in the industry. Uh, these are our plants. Uh, last year, uh, these are some cherry rootstocks that were uh, planted on May 29th. This is a delivery date. These were 18 inch long containerized product and it's green. Most of the time, uh, people plant this stuff dormant. So we were actually able to provide some flexibility to the grower. Uh, they are a, grow a large grower McDougalls. And these plants basically doubled in five weeks being in the ground because they had good roots, by the way. 
No surprise there, right? If, if this is a bare root product, it barely moves. In fact, they had 100,000 bare root product just across the sort of uh, road over there, and it, the plants have not grown up. In fact, they will, they will be, uh, they're growing it this season to be budded next year. Our plants were budded in early July, late August. So we saved this farmer one full year. And, the, and there's no surprise. If you have good roots, the plants will grow fine. Everybody knows that. But we are able to deliver that kind of product now. So that's really exciting. And the main thing is it's uniform caliper. Uh, these trees are pushing right now. And these will basically be you know, uniform trees for the farmer, which makes uh, for synchronous production of fruit. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, ex uh, just an ex comparison, if you do things in a traditional way, you start with one plant, you get about 100 plants in four years. We start with one plant here. We can get up to about 6.5 million plants in four years. How many plants do you need? Okay, for a given variety. So the throughput is huge, but most importantly, it, it's the flexibility and the nimbleness with which we can accommodate multiple types of rootstocks, multiple types of varieties to work with. So that's really exciting for us. The other issue that I kept facing at WSU or the other question that kept, kept coming to my lab was mixed identity of rootstocks and varieties. Now, this may, may or may not be of very high relevance here, but when you have nurseries planting acres and acres of stool beds for uh, Geneva rootstock, and three years later they find out that that was not, not the right type. In fact, we have visited some nurseries on the east, northeast side, upstate New York. They've had these issues. They have seen it. And it's a lot of loss for the nursery. But there have been instances where trees were sold on a certain Geneva type rootstock, and it turned out that, that the architecture was not the right kind. So for a farmer, it's a big loss. So you can keep cursing the trees for the next 15 years on the ground or find out what it is. So we started getting a lot of projects in my WSU lab. Hey, Ahmed, I have this apple variety, which doesn't seem like it's the right type of Honeycrisp. Or this rootstock that I have doesn't look like Geneva 935. Can you check for that? So these kind of projects also started becoming pretty big for us. So we started doing uh, a lot of tests on that. And why was that happening? So my, my lab at WSU actually led the sequencing of the apple genome in the US along with collaborators in Italy. Uh, we've done cherry, we've done pear and almonds and several other plant species now. So we can go from looking at one DNA point to the entire millions of DNA point in, the, uh, in these plant species. So we were able to bring that heart of the press technology directly to the farmer's disposal through this company as well. You've heard these stories many times, right? There have been several mix-ups. If you don't believe me, look up Good Fruit Grower. There are about three articles in the last seven years around mix-ups, which is pretty sad. So what we've done is we've developed these protocols where, and a software where we can actually sequence, develop a fingerprint, and t convert that fingerprint, DNA fingerprint, into a scannable barcode, which, is a, which can become part of your inventory. So if there is a mix-up, we can go back and check what it is, recreate that label, and exactly know what variety or what genotype or what, uh, what type of rootstock it is to completely eliminate any kind of issues. One of the biggest advantages of having this DNA-based information is now we have done some projects where we have gone and told the farmers what do they really have in their orchard. They can change their management plan accordingly. Uh, we've done, uh, we've worked with some pear farmers where they had a root a rootstock called 87, old home farming day 87, but it, essentially it was 97. We told them that. So, okay, now I can really manage this. I don't need to water this plant too much if... I'm sure people grow pears here. 87s are dwarfing, 97 are more vigorous in the same soil type. So if you're managing a rootstock, considering it 87, but it's really 97, you have to change your management style. OK. So this genetic identity aspect can basically avoid any mix-ups before it happens. And of course, as I said, you, if your inventory is based on a label generated from the genetics, which is in, internal, we can re uh, look at it. Basically, it re reduces any insurance costs. It can reduce insurance costs. Consistency. Ensure each and every of 1,000 plants are genetically identical during propagation. So this is a very important point. 
We have, Phytelligence is the only company that gives, uh, that basically provides genetically certified true to type plant material. So we combine the two things. We have an excellent multiplication platform, and as part of quality control, we do a DNA testing. So no matter if you have 1,000 trees or 1 million trees, each and every plant is tested, DNA tested to be true to type. So take the guesswork out of your heads that you don't have to ask the question to yourself, do I really know what I'm planting? I don't know how many people have lost sleep on that. Maybe not. But I definitely I've met with some farmers who are really working with us now. They say, hey, this is a big relief to us. We don't have to wonder what we are planting in the ground today. And then also, uh, we've been basically involved in a few projects to uh, avoid any infringement issues because a lot of these new varieties are going to be good money makers. So you don't want something you've developed, somebody else stealing the budwood. And of course, the saying goes, oh, I did not steal your budwood. I just had loppers in my hand, and at, I did sleepwalking, and I got some budwood at night. This is a tough crowd. I could just crack a joke, guys. Well, that's what happens. Bud would get stolen that way. Anyways, uh, recently we addressed a big pear rootstock mix-up uh, where uh, a nursery was selling a rootstock labeled as 87, but it was really 97. We not only helped fix the problem, identify the problem, we actually sold 75,000 starter material to this nursery, the correct material, so that the farmer in the end benefits. So this is, not, this is kind of the same space of cooperation where we want to make sure the right product gets to the market. And we've done so, over a dozen such tests. In fact, people from other industries are coming to us now. We did some projects with the hazelnut industry in Oregon. Uh, so this is kind of, DNA keeps everybody honest, everybody truthful, and everybody kind of safe from risk. That's the whole point. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. So that's the product available from Phytelligence. But these two parts, I'm going to talk about pre-harvest and post-harvest. I'm grateful to Wynn. He's given me 30 minutes to talk. So people are still awake, right? OK, good, excellent. So in pre-harvest, this again started on the orchard. I have a farmer buddy, Ray Schmidt, and um, Basically, I was hanging out with him in the orchards. And he asked me a simple question. Green pears make more money. And I'll bring it to apples as well. How many of you are apple growers? How many of you do pears? There are a few pear lovers here, too. I consider myself as a pear evangelist, and I can blame it to my pear farmer buddies who've really adopted me more than the apple farmers, so hopefully. Anyway, so he asked me if you can keep the pear, pears green longer on the tree and on the shelf as well. And this is where, in his orchard, I was learning to pick pears and understand what's going on. And this product could be a substitute for Harvesta, actually, uh, because it, it does allow for the fruit to stay longer on the tree. And by the way, it's organic certified. So uh, it, if, uh, how many of you do organic farming? Oh, OK, there's one gentleman. Good. So this was an article that came out in Good Fruit Grower. It's actually the product is uh, glycine betaine. Uh, we actually got a patent on this December 2014, last, uh, in December 2014. Glycine betaine has been known as a stress buster, but we were able to demonstrate that we can delay ripening with this on the tree as well. Uh, this graph over there basically shows the application. This is the harvest date in, in September, and the fruit went into CA storage. When it came out, there was a pretty good difference in, uh, in firmness of these pears. And these pears really stayed green and, and, and very good throughout storage, even at regular atmosphere. But the most important thing is also that we reduced blushing or sun, sunburn eventually from these pears as well. So this could be applied to apples as well. It could also be applied to uh, green apples like Granny Smith and maybe Goldens as well. So this is a completely new sort of aspect, and we are working with some chemical companies to evaluate the effect right now. Well, my colleague, Professor David Sugar at OSU Medford, also did some tests with this to look at fruit quality firmness, russet, internal decay, scab, and post-harvest. And he found some uh, great benefits for this. I just want to show you some results on that. Uh, I don't expect you to read this, so I've summarized the story over here. The untreated fruit showed 34.2% decrease in firmness, uh, starting from seven days before harvest and during storage. Uh, with the glycine betaine, there was only a 4% decrease in firmness, which is reflected in the results also. So um, 
And the big part was comice fruit, for example, comice pears are, I don't, I don't believe anybody grows comice hair. No? OK. Uh, oh, you do that too. Great. We should talk then. Uh, but the, what we showed with comice over here was we were completely able to eliminate internal browning with two applications of this product at 10 pounds per acre. And untreated, there was 33% internal browning. But this, does, this can be applied to apples as well, where you can uh, store the fruit longer. But this is not blocking ethylene pathways. This is an uh, ethylene-independent pathway. So the, uh, the field trial summary here is that the fruit quality and firmness. Comets remained firmer during storage. Internal decay was completely eliminated. We, we also saw a decrease in scab. It was not eliminated. But using glycine betaine with comp other known fungicides also reduced uh, post-harvest decay, actually. So since glycine betaine is not an antibiotic, it can actually, it, the bacteria are not expected to develop any sort of resistance to glycine betaine. So it could be a good adjuvant along with known fungicides. So implications, fruit can stay longer on trees, longer picking season, which can be really beneficial. And if you're doing organic farming or if you want to use compounds that are a little bit more natural, or glycine betaine is naturally produced in plants as well, uh, you can have increased fruit fade. In fact, one of my farmer buddies in Venachi uh, was able to keep his pears uh, longer by two weeks on the trees, thereby increasing his fruit size by one and a half size, which means a lot of money. Uh, effects on storage, uh, longer storage shelf life, increased market, firmer fruit for packing and transport, so less damage. So overall, it increases post-harvest fruit quality. So we are actually doing, we started some commercial trials with a local uh, ag company, Chamberlain's, uh, encouraging results at harvest. So re recall when I was learning how to pick fruit, we did our first trial and I started picking fruit one more time. I could see that the fruit was tearing away from the branches. So that told me it is still immature. If, if I hadn't learned to pick fruit, I would never know. So this is an exciting way to find that out. And uh, we are trying to do some post-harvest quality measurements of this fruit in March and continuing the, some of these trials on the West Coast with multiple farmers now. So I'll switch gears to the post-harvest now. Uh, this is also, um, you just heard a great talk on uh, SmartFresh earlier, and you are familiar with SmartFresh. What I'm going to show you is, again, working with pears, we, we found something that can help. So when you apply SmartFresh to apples, it's great. But you all know that European pears are picked mature, but they're not ripe. Apples are mature and ripe when they are picked on the fruit. So there's the, the, the ethylene release. There's a second burst of ethylene release that in pears that is inhibited. Unless you give it all the cold that it needs, the fruit will not mature. You can give it all the heat treatments. You can basically bathe it in ethylene. Those fruits don't ripen once you apply one methyl cyclopropene. And the predominant hypothesis is that the ethylene receptors are occupied by one MCP, and there is no turnover of receptor proteins. And this is one of those dogmas that was proposed in a paper even for apples, nobody has really shown if receptor turnover is the reason. Not that it bothers you or matters to you. I just wanted to kind of, as Jim Shoup showed earlier, that Dutch cut became a dogma, and everybody does it. And everybody talks about receptor turnovers and whenever it comes to ripening, but there is no real data supporting this. So, and I also did not believe this. So I thought, hey, there are 15 other labs trying to figure out how to ripen one methyl cyclopropene try to treated pairs with ethylene. I will not do that. <laughs> so the question we asked was, is the non-responsiveness to one methyl cyclopropene due to non-ethylene pathways? And we actually did a very comprehensive study to understand the entire um, set of genes that work during ripening in a pear, and we found evidence that ethylene pathways are working normally. There is something else missing. And during this process, we identified some metabolic pathways that are blocked in pears that don't allow the fruit to ripen, and they have nothing to do directly with ethylene. So we identified a set of chemical compounds. These are also produced in the other plants or even in pears at different time points. And we tried to feed that system, try to feed the fruit with those chemicals to see if we can ripen a 1-methylcyclopropene-treated pear. We call it the metabolic override approach. 
So we basically uh, dissolved the ripening compound in water, uh, soaked them for 24 hours, put them in these air flow chambers to measure ethylene, because ethylene evolution is an example or is, a, is an indication of ripening, and also looked at, this is the equipment, GCMS, that, which basically is connected to each of these chambers to measure ethylene. So this is the control fruit. These are bottlets. This is the control fruit with 1-methylcyclopropene. Remains green when it was soaked in water. This is our ripening compound. This was a eureka moment for us. Of course, we didn't say eureka. We had other profanities to say. It works, right? And uh, this fruit basically ripened in five days. Not only did it ripen, it actually had a lot of flavor, a lot of aromas. And in apples also, when you apply Smart Fresh, you, you, you have a fruit that's crunchy, but it has lost its aroma by then. It basically shuts that down. But we were able to uh, revise, revive the aroma as well. But the other thing is that if you use too much of it, you burn the system. You burn the fruit. So here are some results. Uh, basically, the line in the blue, the de that's the deadline. That's your control, which is the Smart Fresh Trudid Fruit. No ethylene production. Zero. And this is the right amount in the red line, which is the 0.5 millimolar of the ripening compound. Within about 48 hours, on the x-axis, uh, you have this, these 1, 2, 3, 4 are measurement time points, which represent eight-hour intervals. And on the y-axis the, is the amount of ethylene evolved. Within about 48 hours, we started seeing a steady increase of ethylene. And the fruit, this is, uh, this is the fruit treated with 0.5 millimolar ripening compound. The fruit became very soft in five days. It dropped to less than four pounds pressure, which is the eating quality, juiciness quality. Of course, these are the fruit treated with too much of the compound. Nothing really happens. And this is the controlled fruit. So this is all great. We were able to show that the fruit can be ripened. Uh, we have, uh, how did it, OK. We have since then also um, uh, started develop protocols where we can gas this fruit called ambient fogging and get the same results. So we also started thinking, how do we help the pear farmers sell more fruit, right? So first product was we started thinking about doing uh, sliced pears. In fact, sliced apples are really a big commodity, and especially we talk about millennials, and most of the millennials are going to be in the northeast area, right? That's the, that's the most populated part of the United States. So we're going to have a lot of millennials here, uh, who would like to have convenience. So we've developed a sliced pear product now in collaboration with Crunchback. And these are some consumer survey photographs we've done at the Hort Show over the last two years. And we've been recently awarded a grant from Washington State Department of Agriculture to do even more broader tests to reach out to the urban communities. And I just wanted to show you some rankings. Uh, this was the initial taste panel analysis. Fruit that's treated with our compound is overall more accept most acceptable to the consumer. This is 2014 data. This is 2015 data. You can still see same story. Our, the, the sliced fruit that has been one methyl cyclopropene treated pears, then subsequently treated with our compound, is most acceptable to the consumer. So this is the first product to market. And we are working with Crunchback, as I told you, as well as Wood Fruit in California to develop this product further. So all of this is actually under the Phytelins umbrella. And we are basically a one-stop shop, not only trying to produce a product, but we have these other technologies as part of that. Uh, we, we do have a product, which is the plant material. We have services, um, which are DNA testing services, a virus screening, and other things as you need it. We can do it because you, you know, this is one company which has the backing of a full-fledged research program at a state land-grant land university. And knowledge, network of experts. Being a professor, I obviously enroll in that company. So if I don't know something, I obviously know to call the right people. You know, I've been calling on Wynn quite a lot because he has a lot of experience. He can give us a lot of information that we don't have about stuff. And similarly, we have a network of individuals across the nation. So we're pretty excited to do some cool research in the lab and also live to see that it's being applied, being grown in, uh, in, in the fields and reaching the consumer today. So that's really exciting for me. Uh, the company has offices basically started in Pullman in a small lab. We basically acquired a 12,000 square foot uh, space in a lab in Portland, which used to be a former Dow Agro facility. And this is eight acres of greenhouse space in beautiful Seattle. That's the Seattle skyline up there. 
So this is a really uh, pretty cool thing. If you really want to talk about somebody coming to America and living their US American dream, I'm living it. And I'm, I'm really grateful to the farming community for adopting me and bringing me to this point. So really, really grateful for that collaboration and, and, and possibilities. So in a nutshell, the company is solving three main problems, which are the pillars of any business, but in, in this context, of course, the, the, the farming business over here. Time is the biggest one. You know, we, we don't have the luxury of wasting time these days and resources. Uh, scale up. If you want to plant 50 trees to 50,000 to 5 million, it can all be done in one go. You don't have to plan over 30 years what, how you're going to plant your orchard. You can do it very quickly. And the final is the guaranteed products. So we take the risk out of the equation. So these are the three main things that the business is solving. And we're looking forward to talking to you uh, at 4 PM. Uh, you're all welcome to join uh, for the uh, open house. And uh, Tim O'Brien, Tim, can you raise your hand back there? He actually grew from, a, from like as the crow flies, maybe a mile away from here, right here. So he's, he's really from here. Uh, I just got transplanted here from New Delhi back uh, in 16 years ago. So we're really excited to be back here. And I think the true Jersey boys, right? And so thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions.